This presentation is about UPDM. No, actually, it's about UAF, but I have to tell you about UPDM because UPDM is the predecessor to the UAF. So, a bit of background. What is UPDM, or in this case, what was the UPDM? It was the unified profile for DODAF, MODAF, and NAF. It is not a new architectural framework. That is to say, what we did is we took the concepts in DODAF, MODAF, and NAF, merged them together in a single meta model, and came up with a combined meta model that could express all three and that allowed you to change from one to the other. It is an enterprise uh, modeling language, so you can model systems of systems, enterprise architectures, and your high-level concepts. It was developed by the members of the OMG, which includes industry, government domain experts, and of course, tool vendors like us. It has now been standardized as an ISO standard, so it's ISO IEC 1951-3 colon 2017. It's been adopted widely and broadly on at least six continents. I don't think it's in Antarctica yet, but maybe I'll go there and build a model of a penguin or something. Who knows? We'll do something. Um, some of the companies you can see there, there's several that are military, uh, U.S. Army, U.S. Navy, um, the Lockheed Martin, Swedish Air Forces, uh, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics. Also in Sweden, Volvo Construction, who are uh, using this to build uh, autonomous systems, Airbus Helicopters in France. And finally, Shell Oil in Australia. So, like I said, lots of adoption throughout the world. It's used in non-military applications, as I said, Shell, Airbus, and Volvo. And what we wanted to do uh, with uh, the UPDM to make it more broadly acceptable to general industries rather than just military uh, contractors, etc., and organizations, is we needed to industrialize it, i.e. demilitarize it, and we wanted to look at some other aspects, some of which really should have been there in the first place, such as security views. Uh, you have an architecture framework for the military, and there were no security views. Uh, the Canadian DINDAF, however, had these, so we adopted these. So as you can see in this slide here, the UAF influencers were MODAF, NAF, and uh, then MODEM, which combined together uh, at the time into MODAF 4.0. It was not finalized. It is now. And the finalized version of NAF 4 will be integrated into a future version of the UAF. It also used the latest versions of DODAF, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, the security views from DINDAF. Why the UAF from the OMG? We changed this because we're starting to get too many frameworks. It was diverging from just the DM, i.e. DODAF and MODAF, and we said, well, we can keep adding letters onto the end of it, or we can just simply change it so that it can express all these. And it really is a unified architecture framework, uh, the U. Also, the need to, as I said, support industry and federal use because people were using this for this. So having a military architecture framework was causing people some disquiet. And this allows us to pull in additional frameworks, if we wish, non-military. Uh, we wanted to support a domain meta model. Uh, we don't mention it here, but uh, DODAF uh, and MODAF, and the Canadians are a member as well as the Australians, are members of the Ideas Group. And the Ideas Group defined an ontology that actually expressed the uh, meta model concepts. We have taken that meta models, merged them together and built a tool based on SysML. However, to make it more generally available, 
uh, we published a separate document that was just the domain meta model. So if someone wants to implement it in IDEF0, relational databases, whatever format they wish, they can do so. Uh, finally, we wanted to make sure we had a standard profile so that we could uh, implement this in UML SysML so that there'd be backwards compatibility for UPDM. Uh, it's been implemented by many tool vendors. Uh, the three of us up here are Deso Systems, without the uh, Grav accent on the E, IBM and PTC, Mega, who is a, a French company, Sparks, who's an Australian company, Tom Sawyer, American company, and Orbis, a uh, British company, I believe, correct? Okay. Uh, other organizations involved in this, DISA, MITRE, Northrop Grumman, and Lockheed Martin. Uh, Laura Hart is also a co-chair, um, and I think she's in the audience. Nope, she's not in the audience. Uh, other people who've worked with us, uh, for instance, Fatma Dandashi was working on uh, versions of DODAF, et cetera, for 20 years and just recently retired. Len Levine as well. Lars Olaf Schildström, uh, who's uh, Swedish and uh, works for Sintel, Antoine Longjean from uh, Mega and Yvon Bijan, who works for Lockheed Martin. Now a little bit about the UAF uh, itself. Uh, so the specification, UAF specification consists of uh, four major parts. So there are four separate documents. If you go and Google UAF uh, OMG, uh, you'll go to the page where you can download specification and you'll find four documents here. Uh, the one document is the uh, meta model and the framework. And it, uh, it's uh, called what we call DMM document, the domain meta model document. The other one is the profile that uh, is uh, UAFP, UAF profile, which is the UAF implementation in SysML. There is also the traceability document, uh, which shows how UAF traces to the different frameworks. And there is also example document uh, that shows uh, search and rescue example of uh, the UAF. So looking into the, the main parts of the UAF uh, specification, we have a domain meta model, as it was said before. So it's the uh, conceptual model of the standard. We have a list of uh, view specifications organized in domains and model kinds. I'll show them in a minute. So you better understand what they are. And we have uh, meta model implementation and a SysML language, which is another standard uh, from OMG. And in general, UAF is uh, what's been said is uh, all the existing frameworks uh, these days, plus uh, additionally, it includes some uh, other aspects like security uh, or systems of systems uh, to actually apply UAF in the broader uh, scope. And uh, looking into uh, in this graphically, we can see that there is uh, normative components of UAF. Uh, these are framework. Uh, meta model and profile, and we also see that there are no normative components, which are traceabilities to other frameworks and the example, search and rescue example. Looking into the ways how to implement UAF, uh, as it was said, we have domain meta model, so it can be implemented directly. It depends really on, uh, on the tool vendors. Uh, then we also have standard based implementation, the SysML based. Uh, provided as the separate uh, document uh, by, by OMG. And so these are for the two vendors that support UML SysML standards. And uh, there can be multiple proprietary implementations as well. And there are some by different tools that uh, implement it, as uh, Matthew said, in the IDEF0 or relational databases. And uh, by using one of those implementations, we can actually build a different views. We can build NAF views, we can build uh, UAF views, and we can build uh, DOTAF views. So it's really the same meta model, the same foundation can be used for uh, building uh, di different architectures, uh, different frameworks. The main benefits be behind UAF, uh, it's first of all, it's model-based approach. Uh, so it's not about the document-based. It's about model-based, so everything is related, everything is traceable. Uh, it is aligned with uh, ISO 42010, which is the architecture description standard. 
Uh, so we have all those co uh, concepts uh, also in the UAF and we make sure uh, we are aligned with existing ISO standards in the same field. Uh, it provides intuitive naming convention on a grid format, which I'm going to present you in the next slide. It provides the uh, also mappings to uh, NAF or DODAF or, or MODAF views so that uh, you really uh, see that uh, they are supported with, with UAF. It provides common vocabulary, what I mentioned, that you can basically uh, develop uh, NAV, DODAF, or MODAF architectures using the same uh, provided uh, vocabulary. And of course, we provide graphical systemal based notations, so uh, we don't invent uh, different notations. Uh, we use the existing ones like SysML, or it's not mentioned in this slide, but we can also use BPM annotation uh, for uh, modeling business processes within the UAF. Uh, also, we have uh, integration with some other OMG standards, like, for example, UML, so you can trace down to the software models from your architectural models, or you can trace down to the system models, and so on. And, um, the other thing uh, which is also important is that we do really care not only about uh, providing the way to build architectures, but we also care about how to integrate these architectures in into overall uh, life cycles. And um, the new domain supported their security, their personnel, the requirements, analysis and simulation. And uh, of course, the other important point is really easy migration from the previous version which we called UPDM or the previous versions of other standards, like for example, NAF 3.1. Now looking into the UAF uh, grid, which really uh, shows how UAF is organized into different, uh, uh, different view specifications. First of all, you can, what you can see in the rows, they're called uh, domains. Every row is a, is a different domain, and every column is, is the different model kind, and every cell and this framework is the view specification, or in other words, you can call them viewpoints. And we do define a meta model for every different viewpoint. So just imagine going on one cell, like for example, operational behavior, and uh, double clicking on it and uh, finding uh, the meta model, the main concepts and main relationships you have to use to build uh, the specific view. So now I go into a little bit more details, and that's the full framework grid. As you can see, there are many things in it. It looks like the periodical elements table, uh, the Mendeley table. Uh, and well, really, it is similar, because the, as you can see, we have many views already here, but there are still some, uh, some views that we have to discover uh, in the future. And uh, just going step by step, through all of those different domains explaining you in, uh, in details what, uh, what they mean. So first of all, we start from metadata, and the metadata is all about uh, how we're going to build architecture, what uh, meta model we're going to use that, or, or the subset of the meta model that we provide, uh, what process we're going to use to build architecture, uh, how our architecture traces to the other architectures or other sources of data within organizations. So basically it's about, it's about uh, all that information that is required really before starting modeling uh, the architecture. Uh, then strategic, this is really where we start uh, modeling and this is where we talk about our enterprise, uh, how our enterprise is divided into different uh, enterprise phases where each of them has different goals, a different set of capabilities, and we go into capability hierarchies. We define how capabilities change in time, uh, and so on. It basically, it's, it answers the question, the question why. Why we are uh, doing the architecture for the specific uh, problem. Uh, then the next step is the, the operational, is to define operational scenarios to achieve the capabilities that we define. And this is where we talk about abstractly about the logical entities uh, participating in the scenario, either mission or the enterprise, depends on what you really model, what's the scope of the architecture. This is where you do business processes, this is where you show how business processes are carried out. This is where you can use BPM annotation for uh, together with uh, UAF uh, to uh, have uh, more expressive uh, uh, operational models. Uh, then services, this is uh, intermediate between the, uh, 
between the what, which is the operational, and how, which is resources. And uh, really, we can define what services are needed for the specific operational processes to be carried out. So we can point to the services. If, if there is a need, we can go down into details. We can model how the specific service is, is uh, realized. And um, then after we define uh, services, we go into resources. So we have a split here into two rows. We uh, have personnel separately from uh, systems separately from human-made objects and natural resources. So personnel allows you to model organizational charts, to model uh, different organizations required uh, to support the, the, the goals that we have at the enterprise level. And uh, also different people filling different posts and uh, really competencies, training plans, etc. And of course, how personnel, how these different people interact with systems, the human factors, so then from personnel, we jump to resources. This is where we talk about systems, about resource configurations required to support capabilities and the operational scenarios. This is where we talk more precisely about what systems are needed for the specific scenario, how they interact together, how they interact with personnel, what are the interfaces uh, required, what's the behavior of uh, different systems, what's the life cycle, and so on. Because when we talk about systems of systems, it's really important to talk about uh, different life cycles of different systems related together uh, to achieve the common goal. Then we have security, which is uh, something new within, uh, within the UAF. Uh, and uh, it really allows you to analyze, first to identify what are the major risks on your architecture, and uh, then to do uh, some analysis on it, plus identify uh, the mitigation resource configurations required to deal uh, with the specific, uh, specific threats. And we uh, finally, when we defi all, define all the architecture, there's a question how we implement it. And the implementation of the architecture is all where it's all defined in the project's viewpoint. This is where we uh, actually define what projects needs to be carried out to uh, implement uh, the architecture that we uh, model. Then we go to the standards. This is where we uh, identify what are the standards that we have to follow. Uh, we relate them to different architectural elements. And uh, one of the final things, final rows, and it's uh, really important and a new thing we introduce is the actual resources. You can call them deployed resources, but really this is where we talk about, uh, about the implementation of the architecture. And this is where we can really verify the architecture, we can simulate the architecture, we can perform various engineering analysis on the architecture uh, based on a different, co different configurations with real systems, real people involved. So this is, this is really the future that needs to be addressed and uh, all simulations they are getting more and more important into systems of system space. Uh, then we have dictionary where we uh, talk about the main concepts. We have uh, summary and overview where we provide the overall architecture information for uh, stakeholders who are not really that technically uh, deep into the architecture and how it's created so that we want information to be provided in the uh, really simple way. Uh, and then of course we have requirements related basically with everything within the architecture this is where we talk about text-based requirements. So we can say that we verify the specific text-based requirement with the specific architectural building block that we built in the architecture. Uh, now quickly going through the model kinds. Uh, we first we have taxonomy. This is where we capture uh, the main concepts and uh, the main and classify those different concepts that we use for operational resources, personnel, etc. Then we have uh, Another example of taxonomy, this shows capability taxonomy really quickly that uh, search and rescue capabilities, they are classified into maritime and land. Uh, operational taxonomy example, Matthew will show you a little bit more examples um, afterwards, so I just really go quickly introducing to the model kinds here. Then we have uh, structure. This is where we talk about composition of different things, of capabilities, of operational performers, of resources. Uh, how they are made of. We can define internals of the specific object, like internals of the resource configuration, where we show how different parts are related in the specific context. 
Uh, then if we go to connectivity, we can address how those different uh, systems related together, what are uh, requirements for them to be related together. We can represent that in different views, like a tabular, as you saw previously, or in the diagram, to show what are the information flows, what are the requirements for the information flows between systems. Then we can jump into processes, start defining behavior. Uh, we can use BPMN for that as an example, right, to define the uh, operational processes. We can also define state-based behavior. This is uh, more for resources to define their life cycle, how the state change, and what behavior the state change uh, invokes. Uh, then we have interaction scenarios where we show how different systems communicate in time. This is where we can uh, capture uh, timing and we can really analyze what happens first and what happens next. And then we have information uh, where we capture the information at different layers of the architecture, business data that goes to the operational, then we can capture uh, uh, data within the services and data deep, detailed data elements within the resources and how they relate it together, how they implement each other. This shows example of the entity relationship diagram uh, that shows how different uh, information elements are related together. And we have parameters, we have measurements, which can be associated with uh, any element within the architecture. And that's really important because you, def you can define uh, what are the required uh, characteristics of the different systems. And later on, after running some tests and simulations, you can really answer the questions uh, whether what, uh, what you required was actually achieved. Okay, this shows uh, how the measures can be defined on capabilities. Uh, then constraints, so constraints, there are some limitations on the architecture. They can be uh, done in, the, in just creating some business rules, structured in English, some uh, other standards like OCL from OMG, or they can be done in, uh, in a model-based approach using system parametric diagrams as it's shown on the picture. Right? So these are the business rules in text that are specified to the architecture. Uh, then the roadmap and the time perspective, it's very important uh, because uh, when we talk about systems of systems, it's really important to capture time aspect and how uh, different resource configurations evolve in time, uh, how different capabilities are uh, actually achieved uh, in time, how our, our enterprise change, how the processes are carried out and so on. This particular example shows the project portfolio where we can see different projects and what, in what state every project uh, is at a specific point in time. And then, of course, traceability uh, between different uh, layers. It's, it's also very important. Uh, it's not only relationships uh, among the elements at the same uh, domain, but we really allow to have traceability along different uh, layers. And uh, this is what really gives value yeah? when you want to do impact analysis. You want to verify if your solution really fits the defined operational scenarios and et cetera. Okay, the other example of traceability here. Thank you, Aurelius. So, good afternoon. My name is Graham Bleakley, and I'm just going to extend what um, Aurelius was saying. So, when we look at the grid, the grid looks flat, okay? The, but really, the grid is not flat, okay? The idea behind that grid is just to show the domains are not exactly the hierarchy of how, they're, how the views are approached and how the information is related. So, when we look at the... Uh, we haven't got a flicker, have we? Yeah, okay. So when we look at really start to understand how the information is related, it looks more like the box underneath. So in this example, what we've got here is you've got the strategic view, which is tied to the operational view. But going up the side of it, we've got services, because services can be reflected in, in parts of the strategic view or the operational view or in terms of personnel and resources. Basically, services in, in UAF act in a different way. They act as a, as a means to abstract um, a behavior from a solution, okay? It's not just about software services. And what this means is that we can come up with a number of different ways of trying to realize uh, some form of operational scenario in terms of the, the physical things that we want to build with it. Um, also, the other thing you can see there is the security views. They tie together the operational and personnel stroke resource type views. 
Oh, thank you, Meg. So they, they tie together the, the operational and the personnel and the resources because this is understanding about understanding the problem in terms of the security domain, and this is about understanding the solution for that domain. Okay? And from this, we've got the actual resources, which is where we can start to do simulation and the projects that deliver them. And then going up the side, we have things like information and standards, which go across everything pretty much. Uh, and then parameters, so we can start to do measurements, we can start to do trade off analysis. And this drives heavily into the actual resources. And then finally, requirements, which, which is normally where it should all start, somewhere along the line. Uh, and then really the data dictionary and the summary of the information that we've actually got in the architecture. So, this is a, another way of viewing the information that you start to see in UAF. And the idea behind this, this is something called a Bailey box. And the idea behind the Bailey box, it was developed by a colonel in the British Army called Colonel Bailey. And his concept was that the box contains all the information and then you have views that either filter the information or they provide insight into a specific aspect of that information. So you'll find that each face of the box represents a, a specific type of domain and then between those domains there are various ways of looking at the information. So if we follow this round, where we've got our strategic taxonomy, um, where we have the strategic taxonomy, we can tie that to the operational processes through the traceability graph because it's, it's this traceability graph which is really important. These views, if they exist outside the context and just on their own or the domains exist on their own, they're not connected to anything. They have very little meaning. It's only when you start to tie them up across those domains with the traceability that you can start, really start to understand the impact and the reason why something is done in a certain way. So when we look at the strategic, it ties down to the operational through the processes. Through the processes, it maps onto some sort of structure, in this case through the swim lanes, and then we can start to see the, the table which shows how all these performers interact with each other, with the information that's being sent and received by each of them. And then we have our, what used to be our OV1, are our summary overview, which gives you an overview of the actual architect or an overview of what the intent of the uh, architecture is meant to be. But then we've got to tie this down onto systems that are going to deliver this. And so the relationship between the operational view and the strategic, or and the, sorry, the resource view is again, it's through the behaviors in this instance. And there's another traceability graph there. And by looking at the process of developing that, we can start to understand what resources we may need and how they interact with each other. And consequently, we can end up with a set of, a set of tables showing the interfaces from that perspective. Um, the key to this, though, is that elements don't live in isolation. They can be seen in, in many different contexts and many different views. And this is the idea of the box. It's... It's a holding point or a container for all the information which you can then pass and you can then view on the various windows. Okay. So when we look at this in a little bit more detail, I, this is basically the UA, this is a simplified version of the UAF information model on a page. I tend to use the, the thread that goes through the behavior and these are all the processes or actions or activities so we have capabilities which are really very big things that we want, we want to be able to do. The operational activities which break them down into the logical domains and then the functions which map them onto how they might be realized in the physical domain and also project activities. But the thread is through that behavior, behavior, uh, behavior line, that behavior traceability. And then we can look at the agents, the things that perform them okay, um, or things that exhibit them. So we have enterprise phases, exhibit paid capabilities, and how they're managed by various organizations and how they're delivered by projects. Um, and then we can look at the logical agents that realize the operational activities, 
and how they map down to those actual resources and the actual organisations that actually deal with how things are developed or how things are going to be realised within the architecture itself. And then these are all delivered by projects. Okay? But uh, the key to this, though, it's, it's quite a rich but rigid, uh, rigid and flexible information model that gives you consistent traceability across the architecture. When you start to do this with SysML, SysML is like a... It's like, a, it's like a dictionary. It tells you what things are. Okay? It, it has the concept of a block. And it's, it's a basic grammar for modeling. When you look at what we have with uh, UAF, it's more like a book. It's a template for a book for your architecture. Because it not only gives you the grammar, but it tells you how the verbs work, how things are connected. Okay? And it gives you a structure so that you can work within that. So when we were looking at this, we also discovered a number of view patterns in the framework. Um, so when we look at structural elements, they tend to map in SysML and UML to block definition diagrams and internal block diagrams. The process stuff is normally mapped to activity diagrams. Um, state-based behavior, well, our state machines, and all of the uh, interaction scenarios our sequence diagrams, and then when we start to look at data exchange summaries, the normal convention for showing these has been uh, table and matrix views, uh, or I squared or N squared charts, and then we, when we look at the traceability matrices, they're basically N squared charts that show you how, how information is connected together. And what is really interesting when you get to start to look at this, it's not just to think about the information that's in the standard views, but to understand, if you really understand the information model, you can really understand a, a lot richer set of information that you might be able to extract from that model. And this is one of the reasons why we went to the grid. It's a separation of, of information from presentation layer. So once you start understanding that information model, you can create views that, or start to specify views on that information to extract what you need from it. So when we look at the key view dependencies, so this is basically a subset of the, of the views that you sort of get by following it down from the capabilities. So we have our taxonomy at the top. It leads down to the structure and the connectivity or dependencies. That traces down to the operational domain, which I talked about earlier on through the processes and then through the operational connectivity, which is a summary of the structure and the interaction scenarios and state machines, ties into services, again through traceability, and also the resources, okay? And then we have the tie in between services over here and the resources that implement them. And the key aspect to this is really tying together the the traceability graph between the various views. This is why we have that column of traceability going the right hand side, down the right hand side. So, how do I navigate these? So there's a fairly generic workflow that you can apply at most of the levels, certainly at the operational systems and service level. Um, the capability level is relatively simple in terms of understanding the capabilities, how they break down but then they need to be mapped to those operational processes. So I typically start with a black box behavior. What do I want the capability to do? How do I want it to work? I then define some agents that might map onto it, okay? It's fairly simplistic. And from that, I can start to allocate that behavior to structure. And the way that I do that is through what's known as a, a white box activity diagram. So, the various elements that we see on the, saw on the previous structure really map to those swim lanes. And we can start to identify interfaces from this. From that, we can start to identify scenarios. And where this leads, ultimately, is from those scenarios, you can start to identify interfaces. And you can start to identify inf information flows. And when you start to look at this now, because of the way the majority of the tools work, those information flows are extracted as a table. 
It's a filter on that information. And it gives you a summary of, of how that information flows around the system. So when we look at our architecture, we can start to understand all the different facets of it. Um, it's basically, for the systems and the resource views, you do exactly the same thing. You can add more information around constraints, which you're probably going to need, and measures, because you need to do this to do your analysis. But the basic flow is exactly the same. So I'm now going to pass it over to Matthew, who's going to go through the, the SAR example. OK. It's a yacht in distress scenario. A few uh, definition. There's something, there's a rescue boat in the model. It's called a, uh, a lifeboat, which is a British term for Royal National Lifeboat Institute, a voluntary organization that goes out and rescues sailors. They're located at various points along the uh, British coastline. And uh, their job is to go out and make sure people are OK. Uh, there's a monitor unit, the distress signal that uh, the yacht sends. It picks it up, passes it on to the command and control center who coordinate with uh, a Navy ship, a rescue helicopter, rescue boats, uh, also any commercial vessels that happen to be in the area. Uh, my apologies, this is a, a bit un illegible, but what it's meant to be showing you is the package structure. When you get the PDF slides, it'll be a little better. Uh, but it's showing you, for instance, here that you have the summary overview of the architecture, the operational views, the concepts, the behavior. So you can break your model up into any way you want. So you can have operational systems. Uh, and uh, resources and personnel all in separate areas, or you can combine them. There is no fixed location, structure, etc. You can break your model up into reusable chunks, so if you wanted to define a set of components, you can do this as well. So how you actually build, construct, reuse, etc. the model is up to you. Here's our uh, concept overview diagram. So as you see here, we have the helicopter, which is a type of aircraft, the uh, yacht, the monitor, uh, the rescue boat, as well as the naval ship, which is a boat. And um, we've also got the control center. But of course, this is a much better diagram. And one of the things to always remember is if someone shows you this diagram, hopefully you're a technical person. If someone shows you this diagram and you're not a technical person, uh, you should see what else that person could do for a living. Maybe ask people if they would like fries with their order or poutine, I guess, since we're in Canada. Um, because you direct these diagrams to the audience. In other words, if it's better to high level views grasp quickly what's going on. Replace all your boxes with graphics. Same diagram, all we've done is just spend a few minutes with Google Images. So make these models actually work correctly. And you can do this on any one. I had uh, one where we're building up, uh, bizarrely, a toy wagon. We've got a diagram. So we have different phases of the toy wagon. And again, we grab different views off the internet to express the different states of the wagon. So in-state models, wherever you like. Graham mentioned, uh, a lot of these things start with requirements, but there's no reason why you couldn't start in a model as your starting point for what are we trying to accomplish. And in fact, almost 20 years ago, I was working in the UK, and this is where the DOD would start. They'd actually build up these architecture models, derive requirements for them. But in this case, what we have is a set of international standards that have come out uh, for the laws of the sea. And what we're trying to do here is break them down. So we have, uh, as you see, the derived relationships, sub-requirements, traces. And you're able to specify things that implement or satisfy the requirement. So you can then generate a table at the end of it and say, I have implemented all my requirements. There's uh, time aspects in here, which is not really uh, a major feature of SysML. 
So we get a lot of questions of why don't I just simply do architecture frameworks and SysML? Why do I need a UAF? It's just complicated. It's got all these extra views. Well, again, you don't need to use all the views. You use the ones that are correct for you. And if you're trying to define that I have a search and rescue operation and it's made up of temporal phases or different parts, uh, and I could say I have phase one where I am providing goodness gracious, fulfilling uh, international uh, obligations, it's really tiny on the screen, sorry. I have my visions of phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase two is I'm uh, providing service, sorry, phase three is services throughout, and the goal of phase two is uh, maintain SAR responsibilities, but also make them more efficient. So I can spell out with time corresponding to each of these, when it's going to happen, also specify what capabilities are going to be deployed. And speaking of capabilities, you're able to define capability taxonomies, also dependencies, uh, and you can say, what are the different capabilities? What are we trying to achieve? If we're doing search and rescue, we're trying to assist people, and we can break this up into maritime, landsar, uh, et cetera. Again, going back to our time theme, you can also say, when will these capabilities be realized or deployed? By what systems? Who is responsible for them? And what are the capability metrics that are going to be achieved by each phase? You can also, you see the red points over there, they're expressing what's called a capability gap. So someone specified the project schedule and specified what systems are going to be deployed when they come online and offline. But unfortunately, as you see there, there's a capability gap. It's telling me that I don't have any overlap. So if someone's in trouble in the sea uh, during that month, um, they're going to get very cold waiting, right? So it's a good idea to make sure that you define these. Uh, and this is the project uh, schedule view that again shows me what are the different milestones. Each of these is associated with a person who's responsible, the project, and you can have different types of milestones such as uh, actual milestone, just simply deploy some, uh, something has occurred, systems have been deployed, systems have been removed from service, uh, maintenance uh, updates, et cetera. For the capability clusters views, I can then say, okay, let's do a, say I'm doing SAR phase one. What capabilities are a part of SAR phase one? I can then show a SAR phase two and say, these are the new capabilities I'm going to have. SAR phase three, create another one, etc. I can also say, what if I've got land SAR as opposed to a maritime SAR? I'll need different capabilities. Some will be in common, but the system supporting them will be different. So I'm now to find what I'm trying to accomplish, a capability being the ability to achieve a desired outcome. I need to say, what do I need to do? So early on in the architecture, it's not what does it, it's what do I need to do? What is the functionality that's going to do this? So for searching, I need to find the victim, monitoring the help, track the victim, and then transit to a SAR operation. And there's other uh, mappings for the other capabilities. So it gives you a logical walk through. You can then take something like search and say, these are the sub things for search, track victim, navigate, send distress signal. And then I can map these out into a activity diagram. I can show the order in which they take place. What are the inputs? What does it need to know before it operates having operated? What does it then tell other people about or send? Again, if I'm making soup, my output is soup. What things are done in parallel, etc. And I haven't, again, yet specified who is doing this. I then start looking at my operational nodes, or in this case, the, in uh, our uh, architecture, they're called operator performers. I can specify the taxonomy. So this is, again, I'm starting to look at my different phases here and showing that uh, the tactical, uh, MSAR tactical is going to be the upper one, and then I'll add capabilities in two and three. And then I can build this into a actual architecture, define the interchanges, which can be energy systems or just plain old information, and define these interchange models between the different elements. 
Then specify the activity diagrams, go revisit them, and say who is actually performing these activities. And by dragging the activities into those swim lanes, representing the different physical aspects I defined earlier, I'm performing this allocation. So then when I generate one of these reports telling me that I send a uh, status from uh, the uh, rescuer to the uh, asset control, what am I doing to send it? Well, I'm providing medical assistance, I'm recovering the victim, and when it's received, what happens to it? So it allows me to actually specify this. And if I have blank boxes, it tells me, apparently no one does anything to send this message, and no one does anything when they receive it. So I've got a gap here. I need to fix this. You can model, as uh, Aurelia showed you, the, the physical systems that you have here, as well as the people. And you can generate tables, but also these n-squared diagrams to show you uh, what are the interfaces, and this one's in an Excel spreadsheet, so you can then use uh, some uh, macros to actually uh, prioritize them. One of the things that we added with this version were personnel views. If anyone's interested in more detail, I've got a sl another slide set which I gave uh, earlier, and I presented a paper at Incozy on the personnel view, so it allows you to look at the human factors. I'm happy to share it with you. But in this case, as I said, we're modeling the people, organizations, and responsibilities that we have here. We can then build up competency frameworks and show which organizations require each uh, competence and which ones actually uh, require have each responsibility. So I'm able to specify these. There's time-based elements so I can show how these capabilities are developed over time. I can also specify posts to say who needs a uh, capability and who provides it. But again, I didn't want to spend the entire day showing nothing but personnel. Here's the final one where I can specify, for example, the searcher has to be able to search in calm sea, high seas, arctic and cold, uh, darkness, low clouds and low lights. He has to recover the victim, so we're saying what he does, under the conditions of the different water temperatures, apply first aids, uh, what are his motivations, what does he try to do, what are his constraints, etc. So in addition to just simply saying he does this, I can define a whole universe around how he does it, why and where. The security views allow me to define these different elements that are involved in security inside the system and also what are called security enclaves. I can then build these up into architecture, show the interactions, uh, show the different cross-domain solutions, the different resource roles, as you see at the top. Inside the architecture, I have a security enclave so I can specify the different systems that are a part of it, the interfaces between them, etc. And then I can generate tables representing the rules and non-functional requirements that correspond to these. So I can say across the top, what are the things I do? What are the different uh, elements that they're meant to support? Thank you, Matthew. All right, so uh, just a quick wrap up for me. So in terms of the tools that are implementing um, UAF, we have Enterprise Architect from Sparks, Integrity Modeler from PTC. Um, I server by Orbis Software. These are what, that is one of the tools that's more of an enterprise architect a more known enterprise architect tool, which is using the DMM as the implementation rather than the SysML. OPEX by Mega. Uh, Magic Draw from No Magic Stroke Dasso Systems. Um, in, there's a couple of there which aren't as much uh, UAF tools, but they are supporting tools that help us a lot. So Model Center is very important. What Model Center does is it provides a way to combine parametric models that we define in UAF, and it allows you to do, to do trade study analysis. So you can start to define different architectures, and if you've got the appropriate information in there, you can start to do trade study analysis. Will it make my capability, or will it be able to meet my capability needs based upon the information that I've put in there? And so we can start to judge between various architectures. Um, Tom Sawyer is a 
another tool, and this works in a very different way. Tom Sawyer is a visualization tool, and when we start to build these architectures, they get very complicated uh, very quickly. Okay? And there's a lot of information that we, ne we need to see and need to show the connectivity between. And Tom Sawyer provides a way to visualize that information and filter it directly on the information itself. It's not about working with the diagrams per se, but it's about looking at the information that's actually in the model. So this really allows you to dynamically play with the Bailey box. And it's a very powerful mechanism to do that. Um, Rhapsody by IBM, uh, Sodius, who do a lot of the tool integrations, and also System Architect by Unicom. So in terms of uh, UAF version one adoption, it's been picked up by, uh, or we've been asked by a number of, been picked up by a number of companies, many of them which you've seen already on the slides previous. So you're looking at uh, NATO, Northrop Grumman, uh, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, MITRE, uh, Navy, uh, Defence, Vencor, um, Air Traffic Control, Norwegian Air Traffic Control Authority, Volvo Construction, also places like AVIC in China, which are using this for air traffic control as well. Um, Saab, Leonardo, it, it's a growing band of people that are taking this seriously and starting to understand the benefits that are, that are coming from it. Um, in terms of UAF from a NATO perspective, so we've been working a lot with NATO over the past couple of years, uh, partly be well, because we say that we support NAF. Um, so about two years, well, about a year and a half ago now, we had, we've been having meetings with uh, NATO and they evaluated uh, two meta models to support NAF. One of them was UAF and the other one was Archimate and they ended up picking them both. Um, and basically they have a vision to use Archimate and UAF models interchangeably. Um, don't know how realistic this is per se at the moment but it's we know that there's a lot of work needed to realize this vision and it's probably some of the work that's going to lead on to what we do in UAF 1.2 and going forward. Um, as part of this, NATO is encouraging and advocating the, the cooperation between OMG and the Open Group. So the Open Group manage Archimate, OMG manages uh, UAF, SysML, and there's a number of other touch points that are going on here as well, which interact with UAF, something around FACE, uh, and also the Business Architecture Guild tends to get involved as well. As a starting point, really what we're looking at is traceability between the meta-model concepts that need to be created in both, or equivalent meta-model meta -model concepts that need to be created in both, both domains and trying to use some, some loose domain coupling based upon OSLC to at least start creating the links so we can get traceability across them. So in terms of our roadmap, um, we published UAF December last year. It came out officially. Uh, we started the revision task force uh, in June last year. We basically had a meeting this morning that decided that we were gonna deliver our latest revision basically in March. It was meant to be down for December, but we basically we'd run out of time considering the amount of work we've got to do. And we've also got a reserved ISO number uh, and we intend to deliver this in 2019 stroke 2020 and that will be 19.517. So in terms of the, the future roadmap, very simply, it's a very short roadmap at the moment, but one of the big things is we need to provide process guidance. Um, so we intend to write some process guidance over the winter. May not be, it won't be included in UAF 1.1, but it will be added as, as a non-normative part of the specification, but we might add this as a normative part in 1.2. And then we've also got to start defining this semantic mapping and some form of uh, vendor neutral interchange so that we might be able to work with Archimate tools. And longer term, with UAF 2.0, and this will probably be about three years' time, maybe four, we've got to look at how we embed SysML 2.0 into UAF and start to use SysML 2 in, in the context of UAF. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.